I am Games, and this is a retrospective. Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest have dominated the cultural consciousness of what is a long-running epic fantasy JRPG franchise for over three decades, and while no shortage of others have sprung up from copying their formulas and style, the most virulently persevering of those is the Tales of series. Emerging first on the Super Nintendo in 1995, a time when JRPGs were about as saturated as they might ever be, and when competition was fierce both on and off the platform, the Tales series made a name for itself on the basis of one radical design change from its traditional predecessors, an active combat system. Notwithstanding the fantastic character designs of Ah My Goddess and Your Under Arrest creator Kosuke Fujishima, and the decidedly anime-esque slant that these games take towards characterization, the so-called linear motion battle system has always been the standout feature of the franchise, taking the scope of an RPG adventure and combining it with the action of what essentially plays like a slowed down and somewhat tactical fighting game. These light touches on the traditional formula have allowed the series to carve itself a lasting niche over 20 years years, in spite of middling critical reception to certain games and hugely diminished technical impressiveness as modern gaming has relegated the entire genre comparably to the budget bin. I'm going to take a look at each of these games one by one to figure out how the series has survived so well, what steps it's taken to improve on itself over time, and which games still hold up as enjoyable experiences to this day. These are the Tales of Tales of, starting with the very first one, Tales of Fantasia. Retrospectively, it's amazing that the first Tales game not only managed to see release, but to do so in such a polished form as to have so much influence. Developed by a studio called Wolf Team, with a complicated history of trading ownership and publishers between its various games, Fantasia ran into issues when publisher Namco started demanding major alterations to the game's core narrative and structure, originally based on lead programmer Yoshiharu Gotanda's unpublished fantasy novel, Tale Fantasia. Creative disputes over having to cut so many integral aspects of the story caused Gotanda and some of the other core staff to leave the production and form Studio Triace, quickly resulting in the Star Ocean series followed by Valkyrie Profile and many other action RPG classics. Meanwhile, Namco retained all the rights to Tails as an intellectual property, and Wolf Team's partial owner Telenet went ahead and restaffed the team so as not to lose out on the lucrative publishing deal they had with Namco. In the end, I suppose it all worked out, since Tales of Fantasia turned up complete enough to kickstart a whole franchise out of, and Star Star Ocean became a classic in its own right, so everybody wins, but we'll talk about the differences between the original concept and what we actually got later on. One of my goals with the Tales of Tales of series is to identify the best possible way to engage with each of these games today, and considering that Tales of Fantasia was released five times over the course of 12 years, this means breaking down the differences between the Super Famicom original, its PlayStation remake, Game Boy Advance re-remake, and multiple PSP ports. It probably won't surprise you to hear that the Super Nintendo game is the hardest to start with today, but that isn't to say that there's nothing uniquely going for it. By far the biggest loss after this version is the phenomenal background art of its random battles. Stuff like hiding the characters in the tall grass of a field encounter, and cliff sides which push detail into every available pixel on the screen are sadly lost in future versions of the game, wherein the art design, while still strong, isn't as imminently memorable. This game's rustic, darker color palette and layer dress high fantasy character designs which clearly came before the ones that the game was eventually marketed with arguably look and animate better than the huge headed sprites of the PS1 remake, and the way characters dart around the screen at high speeds with flashing spell effects everywhere is quite visually satisfying. Considering how much of the game consists of fighting, these are important advantages to have, but ultimately do more to sadden me that the PlayStation remake didn't maintain these attributes than to sell me on playing the Super Nintendo game. After all, the PS1 version massively overhauls the mechanics of the original to enrich the gameplay experience. Considering the mere three years between the two, it almost feels like an attempt at outright correcting the original, and considering that it not only came out after the massively tweaked second game in the series, Tales of Destiny, but also built upon that game's systems even further, this is probably a fair characterization, an attempt to give new fans of the PlayStation's Destiny an excuse to not have to go track down a Super Nintendo to play the first game. We're going to be talking about the PlayStation game for the bulk of this video, but for now, let's summarize all the ways that it improved on the Super Nintendo game. 
By far the most important change is to the quality and frequency of battles. While the SNES game was hugely innovative for its time by featuring an active battle system in what is otherwise a traditional RPG, said battle system was pretty bare bones. Pressing the attack button will have your character dash in and out of enemy range and slash at them contextually based on their position. You pick up sword skills which variably work at close or long range, automatically activating on the basis of your current distance from the enemy, but that about does it for your control over the player avatar. You can also access a spell menu and select what each of your teammates does, with all of them being spellcasters who need time to charge their attacks, but if you're heavily managing your party's moves, then the game will slow down to something more closely resembling a traditional RPG anyways. You can't assume control over your party members beyond this, and you can't even use items with them, which seems like an odd choice. On the PlayStation, your abilities are expanded considerably. Instead of reacting to the enemy contextually, your slashes will do different things based on holding down up or to the side along with the attack button, and you can assign different sword arts to each of these directional outputs to be used by pressing the arts button. There's a larger range of abilities, and some of them can chain into one another for combos. Your teammates can use items now, and if you want to, you can set any of them to the front of the party and control them instead, although it's not really advisable since they're all pretty worthless at close range combat, and you'll just be diving into menus to cast spells while your AI controlled tank fails to do what you were meant to. Still, there is some purpose to making the teammates controllable, and that is multiplayer. Most of the Tales of games have what I like to call Younger Sibling Mode, wherein up to four players can take control of the other party members during battles. It's pretty limited, but if you can teach your younger sibling to use the right spells consistently, then you won't have to spend as much time micromanaging your teammates' spell usage during the harder late game boss fights, and you won't have your kid brothers begging you to give them a turn with the console when you're trying to make it through a 35 hour RPG. On that note, adding a run button means that even with the game's lightly expanded scope compared to the original, you'll be traversing it at a satisfyingly brisk clip. Other mechanics have been added in from the follow-up Tales of Destiny, such as the cooking system, which replaced the food stack from the original. In that game, you could carry food on your character to be used automatically when needed, which is kind of cool, but since you can also just use items whenever you want in battle, and in the remake, even teammates can use them as well, it isn't all that necessary. Granted, the cooking mechanic isn't either. You still gather food with minor healing properties throughout the game, but now you can have someone in the party cook it into a meal which disperses healing across the entire party. This can be really helpful in cases where perhaps several members of the party have the same status ailment and a meal could cure it on all of them without having to waste multiple curative items, but this happens so rarely and healing items are so common that it doesn't seem super necessary, though I'm sure this would change on higher difficulties. Story-wise, the PlayStation game adds in a lot more flavor to spice up the admittedly very basic plotline. Cutscenes are padded with a bit more character establishing dialogue, and now you can press the select button on the world map at any time to watch a fully voiced interaction between your party members, usually more as a reminder of what's going on in the story and where to go next, but in certain contexts for the sake of some fun little comfy scenes that bring the characters to life in small ways. As someone who isn't a fan of how modern JRPGs sometimes let in themselves with so much frivolous dialogue that cutscenes become a chore, I would say that the remake adds just the right amount to make the characters feel more real realized without getting obnoxious, and that going back to the Super Nintendo version afterwards left me feeling like certain scenes originally had a lot less impact. In spite of the CD format upgrade though, the PlayStation remake doesn't enhance the music to the extent one might prefer. Personally, I wasn't a big fan of the game's soundtrack in the first place, though I've seen opinions going in either direction, so make of it what you will. It's certainly an eclectic set of songs, with a large mixture of styles and lots of frenetic, weirdly bass-driven songs in occasionally questionable locations. The first time I entered the town of Euclid and heard some out of control drums and winding melodies, I was just confused. At least I can say that the style works out well in the battle themes, which is the most important music in any JRPG. Tales of Fantasia was originally famous for a different audio related reason though, and that is being the first Super Nintendo game to feature extensive voice work. Not only does it contain a vocalized opening theme, but characters will shout the names of attacks in battles too. The PlayStation version goes a step further by featuring a random spattering of voiced lines throughout the story, as well as fully voicing all of the select button cutscenes. The cast is comprised of some pretty big name seiyuu of the mid 90s, such as Junko Iwao and Takeshi Kusao, but the 
the barebones story and relative awkwardness of how random the voice lines are doesn't leave them much room to do any serious acting. All in all, the voicing feels more like a nice bonus than a meaningful feature at this point, considering how full voicing is pretty much industry standard now even for budget RPGs. Visually, while I would argue that the SNES version has the more aesthetically interesting background art in its battles, the PS1 version is still no slouch in that regard, and there's no question that the tile sets of its towns and dungeons are vastly superior. No matter how much of the game might be spent in battles, it's a lot easier to care about saving the world when it looks like a cool place to explore than when it's kind of muddy and gross as it is in the original. The weird-ass giant-headed chibi sprites that you see in battle are definitely not my favorite, though the character portraits used in some cutscenes are the best way that you'll get to see these characters represented between the two versions. Easily the most important visual upgrade though is the overworld. This brand of 3D map was standard in PS1 RPGs, and while this one's pretty generic and not particularly large, I still think it looks better than the one in, say, Final Fantasy IX, and is a massive improvement over the garish 2D map of the original game. Having said that, I don't know if I prefer how the larger 3D world increases the travel time between areas, as well as frequency of random battles therein. All in all though, I really liked the way this world map contrasted with the 16-bit style of the towns, creating this strange feeling of being in the interstice of two console generations in a way that few other games capture. Beyond the overhauling of the original game, the PS1 version also adds an additional hidden party member, a bonus dungeon, and no shortage of minute goodies that flesh out the experience further. All told, if you were to go back to the PlayStation version after having played later games in the series, you'll feel yourself a lot more at home in your expectations of what a Tales of Adventure contains than you would by playing the SNES game. Likewise, the Game Boy Advance port adds in its own handful of extra details, most closely resembling the PS1 game in mechanics and aesthetics, but while scaling back some of its bigger technical leaps like the world map and its voiced cutscenes. This game is honestly the worst of both worlds in every way though. It's easily the ugliest graphically, and that's coming from someone who generally tends to prefer GBA aesthetics over Super Nintendo. Had they ported the SNES art design instead of creating a worse version of the PlayStation art, it might have come off better, but the GBA port is kind of loaded with problems regardless, most notably some terrible frame rate slowdowns in a lot of the battles. Unfortunately, the GBA version is the only one to have been officially translated into English and brought to America, and the translation is bad. Most infamous for its mistranslation of Ragnarok as Kangaroo, this version of the game should honestly just be avoided if you can help it. Both the Super Nintendo and PS1 versions have full translation mods that you'll easily find patched into the ROMs of these games online, and the PS1 version even has both a more literal version and a localized one, styled to feel more like a good official translation. I played with the latter one, by Fantasian Productions, which is the version of the game I'd most highly recommend. Sadly, there remains a lack of English translation for what appear to be the most superior versions of the game, its multiple PSP ports. The first of these, Full Voice Edition, is mostly known for a change that I shouldn't have to explain, and adds the bonus content of the GBA version back into the framework of the PS1 game. My favorite change, though, is a vast improvement on the battle sprites to finally make them actually look like the character artwork. Even still, the most complete version of the game, at least from my observation having no way to play it, is Tales of Fantasia X, another PSP adaptation which was included as a bonus with the PSP remake of the Game Boy Color sequel to Fantasia Narikiri Dungeon. The biggest change this time is a more streamlined battle system which no longer pauses when your teammates use spells, which seems like a tremendous improvement given how much time is spent waiting through spell animations in the regular game, and makes me want to try that version very badly, even though I don't much care for the aesthetic of its battle HUD. Anyways, now that we've broken all that down, it's time to dive into a full bore analysis of what I consider to be the best version of Tales of Fantasia playable in English, the PlayStation remake with fan translations. If you're disappointed that I won't be going into more depth about the unique experience of any other version of the game, I encourage you to make your own video about it. Or to promote this one enough that I'd feel inclined to go back and do it myself. The opening hours of Tales of Fantasia are honestly so generic as to feel like borderline parody, to an extent which makes the thought of Namco's mandated story changes weigh heavy on the mind and absolve any question of why the original project leads took off. 
Tale Fantasia, after all, was meant to be far more experimental, telling three different stories with their own protagonists across various time periods in the grand narrative, sort of similar to how Valkyrie Profile would shape up just a few years later. While the first of these storylines was cut for space concerns, the second was cut by a Namco mandate to focus on the story with the traditional swordsman protagonist all the way through. Now, I couldn't tell if this was just a weird quirk of the translation that I played, or a weird quirk of the game itself, but Tales of Fantasia allows you to name each of your party members after they've already been addressed by name in the story text, and even to change their names whenever the hell you feel like. So I named the main guy Games, and that's what I'm going to be calling him for the rest of this video. His quote unquote real name is Kless, but I don't care. The game told me he could be whoever I want him to be, so he is Games. Games begins his story in the most expected way a fantasy protagonist could, having his hometown destroyed by corrupt soldiers seeking a magic pendant which his father had given to him for safekeeping. Now, in the original Tale Fantasia story, the first protagonist would have been a young girl who works as an assistant to the game's main villain, Daos, and watches his descent into evil as he turns to elimination as a means of preventing humans from using magic technology, powerful tech which puts absorbent strain on the world's natural magic resources and is bringing death to the world tree, Yggdrasil. From the perspective of having seen this story play out, followed by a second one which follows through Daos's moral of Event Horizon, the destruction of Games' hometown would represent the birth of the opposition force that naturally arises from the use of violence as a means to even a noble end. This theme is still present in the story eventually, but instead of tinging Games' entire story with the tragic edge of knowing that his revenge mission is against someone trying to save the world through horrid methodology, this is instead a late game twist with significantly diminished impact. Nevertheless, it's not as though humble beginnings are a huge black mark on a JRPG considering they are par for the genre's course, and it's not even like this game takes more than a few minutes to get the village burnt down and the ball rolling, but it's just a shame to think what could have been. Some of the early game dialogue, like from a man standing next to a giant bell talking about how he's supposed to ring it in case of an emergency but hasn't ever had to, only for that bell to sound about a gameplay minute later as soon as the heroes have left town, feel like the game was honestly trying to take the the piss out of itself for how cliche it is. Even in this early section though, the game has some endearing qualities and memorable moments. My first pang of affection for it came when exploring the burned out village after all the cutscenes were over and finding a sword left behind by one of the attacking soldiers amidst the rubble, which I then proceeded to take with me. Little pieces of contextual flair and easily missable secrets are pervasive throughout the game, as in any classic JRPG, and do much more to bring the world to life than the central narrative does. Also endearing and consistent throughout the game is its openness. Personally, when I play RPGs, I try to do everything I possibly can at every point before doing the thing which I know will progress the story, and Tales of Fantasia will gladly allow you to throw yourself at challenges beyond your current station if you're feeling brave or just love to grind. Your first quest is simply to head south from the starting village and enter the forest, returning to find the village destroyed, but if you want a little bit more time in that little idyllic valley town, you can just as easily wander the world map and get your ass kicked in caves well beyond your level. Later on, there will be several parts when the game asks you to tackle three or four dungeons at different places on the map in whichever order you feel like, so you rarely find yourself being streamlined or railroaded through the main plot. If you do spend this bit of extra time exploring in the early game, you'll quickly realize that random battles are going to be constant. However, given that loading in and out is fast, the music is cool, and the active battle system is consistently fun to play, it kind of feels like fighting constantly is, you know, the point. Going out of your way to to explore and fighting everything that challenges you will give you a huge leg up in experience points, and if you end up getting lost early on like I did and five or six levels over what your nearest game facts guide would recommend, then you'll pretty easily skate through any battle in the game on normal mode. If that sounds like a problem for you, there's always the option to switch combat to hard mode on the fly, and once you've beaten the game, you can unlock an even more challenging playthrough. One of the most unique things about the Tales of games is that, thanks to the ability to actively dodge and block enemy attacks, a good enough player can make it through any challenge at absurdly low levels just for the fuck of it. Though in the case of Fantasia, I'm not sure that every enemy attack is actually possible to dodge. 
It's at this point that I must bring your attention to an important aspect of playing this game with the fan translation mod. You see, Tales of Fantasia features three different combat modes, auto, semi-auto, and manual. The standard mode is semi-auto, in which your character will automatically position themselves at the press of each button, meaning that you can simply mash the attack or arts button along with whichever directional input you want, and your character will automatically run in and out of position to use it. Manual mode, meanwhile, gives you complete control over your character and allows for much more technical precision. It is usually recommended, especially in late game boss fights. However, in the official versions of the game, you can only actually use the manual controls once you've acquired and equipped the technical ring, which you likely won't until at least 8 hours into the game. This pisses a lot of people off, especially coming back from later games in the series which don't impose such a restriction, but personally, I hadn't even noticed because in the version I played, games had already been equipped with a technical ring from from the beginning. Unfortunately, the Fantasian Productions website no longer exists, and I couldn't find any information about whether this had been modded into the game, but considering that every source and guide I could find talking about the PlayStation version seems to suggest that your first technical ring is indeed found in the place that I acquired my second one, I think it's safe to assume that this was a mod. Suffice it to say that if semi-auto controls are a turnoff for you, then you might want to stick to this version of the game, though personally I ended up using semi-auto throughout the entire game anyways because I I was playing on normal difficulty and over leveled and I didn't want to have to think about anything because that's just how I roll, but you do you. So anyways, after your town's been ramshackled, Games decides to hurry off to the next town where his uncle can help him out, while his best friend Chester, nah just kidding, we're calling him Tom Bone, stays behind to bury the dead. This is the first of many times throughout the game which left me feeling like Games was kind of the least interesting or likable character in the cast, and like everyone around him had much more of a pulse. While Tom Bone is presented as sort of a hot-headed idiot who rushes into danger without enough hesitation, it's not as though Games' personality particularly particularly contrasts with his aside from coming off as a bit more of a coward. Over the course of the story, Games seems to become a bit more confident just as a result of literally being more powerful and not really having any reasons to be worried, but I wouldn't say that he undergoes a meaningful arc in the way that some of his teammates do. While Tom Bone's personality isn't particularly deep, it's a shame that he doesn't spend very much time in your party even at the start of the game, and once you're separated from him by the game's first early twist, you won't be seeing him again till the final stretch of the adventure. Upon arriving in the town of Euclid and meeting his uncle, Games is immediately betrayed and imprisoned, and it's here that the game lands its best emotional gut punch with a series of dark reveals. Games hears a voice through the wall of his prison cell and is able to use its advice to break said wall down, only to find a corpse on the other side of a woman with a sword in her gut. Games promptly retrieves the weapon, and here we learn that in order to use items on the environment, they must actually be equipped by a character. I thought this was cool from an immersive standpoint, though you will find yourself in situations later where it results in treating a party member as something akin to an HM slave for at least one accessory slot, so your mileage may vary. It never caused me any problems. Once broken from his cell, Games frees a young girl named Mint. Oh, hi, Mark! These names will make sense if you watch the I Am Games live streams, I swear. Oh, hi, Mark informs Games that her mother should be in one of these cells as well, cueing the heart-wrenching dramatic irony which Games doesn't have the heart to reveal to her. What finally got me is when I I tried to walk across the room and Games stopped in his tracks, thinking to himself that he couldn't bear to let this girl witness the scene in the cell. Here the grimness was finally palpable. All in all, this was probably my favorite story moment in the game. From there, the first couple hours consist primarily of the lead up to your character's first confrontation with the evil Daos after he's been awakened from imprisonment by a foolishly opportunistic mercenary expecting to control his power. In the lead up to this segment, you'll learn a handful of sword arts with games and then be given access to a special move that you probably can't use yet. As it turns out, each of the game's sword techniques have to be mastered by using them a certain number of times in battle, and the special moves which combine two of these arts into one attack are only used usable once each of their base moves have been mastered. As such, it's generally a good idea to use a lot of sword arts in battle so that you can unlock these, and the game encourages you to do so by replenishing small amounts of TP after each battle, and keeping rejuvenative items not only in constant supply as battle rewards, but also cheap to purchase from the shops. 
Once you've made it to the end of your first proper dungeon and confronted Douse, an older support character named Morrison will send games and Ohimark into the past in a desperate ploy for their survival. And this is really when the game kicks off in earnest. Immediately upon arriving a hundred years in the past, the game begins to develop a sense of personality, starting with a fun little scene introducing the idea that elemental magic had existed in this world's recent past, but has already transpired into legend by the party's era, in which the only fashion of magic remaining is that of the clerical arts practiced only by a few. Time travel, it seems, was all the rage in Japanese games of the era, and a JRPG releasing nine months after the massively successful Chrono Trigger with a similar brand of time travel plot will certainly ring suspect to some, but Fantasia actually handles the concept very differently. By far the majority of the game is spent a hundred years in the past, and at the end you travel a mere 50 years ahead of your starting point, with none of this traveling taking you so far as to drastically change the technology of the times. Instead, it's more about studying the ramifications of certain traumatic events in the world's history after their effects have just had enough time to settle. Bear in mind that the time travel mechanics don't even attempt to make any sense or avoid paradoxes and should definitely not be thought about too hard, but the uniqueness of what they're used to explore is at least commendable. Eventually, you'll get the mage Ben Saint on your team, and I don't even feel bad about that nickname as their personalities are exactly the same and his original name was Clarth, which is just terrible. Ben Saint is, in my opinion, the actual main character of this game. His sardonic, wise-ass dialogue is by far the most fun to read, and he not only has the most of it, but does the most important things. A huge part of your quest involves summoning and teaming up with a host of powerful spirit beings, and all of that is handled by Ben. He's the one who tends to do the talking when you meet with various kings or important sorcerers, and he's easily the strongest person on the team in terms of raw firepower. Even in gameplay terms, it gradually becomes clear over the course of the game that your main role in controlling games is to operate as a non-traditional kind of tank. Not so much in the sense of accruing aggro, but more just moving your enemies around the battlefield, corralling and stunlocking them so that they can't get to your mages, who do the bulk of damage in any of the major boss fights, or wipe off half of the smaller enemies in more crowded random encounters. If Ben didn't bring enough personality to the game on his own, Digibro, yes I named the pink haired flat chested mage girl Digibro instead of Arch and I make no apologies about it, brings the rest. She's a cheery, brash, and endlessly flirtatious young half elf spellcaster rivaling Ben's summons for raw power, but with a much bigger range of attacks on top of that. She can also fly around on a broom, which you would know if you got into a battle with her right away, but considering that I initiated the castle break-in scene before having actually fought with her in my party, I was pretty confused when the character said that they could use her broom to fly to the second floor. Just one of those weird quirks of how older games are structured. Speaking of the castle break-in, this is one of those parts in JRPGs which always drive me insane. When a single guard spotting you results in the whole party getting jailed, even though you frequently murder enemies exactly like these ones in battle. Tales of Symphonia was particularly bad about this, and that reminds me that I mentioned that Tales of Symphonia is a direct prequel to Fantasia? Granted, it's set like 4,000 years earlier, but if you noticed that some of the names and iconography in this game were similar to that one, it is indeed intentional. One thing established here and expanded on there, for instance, is the exploration of race relations between humans and elves. In this world, the elves have secluded themselves from humanity on the basis of their involvement with magic technology, and have disowned all of the half-elves, including Digibro, considering them even lesser than humans. Fantasia mostly uses this for character drama with Digibro, but Symphonia goes in on those themes in a lot more depth, and all around feels like an attempt to expand on a lot of the ideas present in Fantasia, almost like a full-blown modernization of the classic. Even the infamous hot spring scene from Symphonia has its origins in the bonus section of the PlayStation's Fantasia. Once you've got your main party of four together and made it to the second continent some six or seven hours into the game, you'll find it opens up in a big way by allowing you to take on four different dungeons in whichever order you'd like, three of which contain elemental spirits that you need to complete the fourth one. Nearly every dungeon in the game has some kind of unique gimmick that keeps it fresh, and with the exception of a few tentpole dungeons around the halfway, two-thirds, and ending points of the game, they're all very short, clocking in around 15 minutes or so if you're as overleveled as I was. It's at this point, though, that I need to be clear about something extremely vital to the gameplay experience. Simply that, unless you have the patience and time of a saint, you're probably going to need a guide on hand to make it through this game in any kind of timely fashion. 
Oftentimes, while the game will tell you what you have to do by way of select button cutscenes, how to go about doing it will be utterly unclear. When it comes to progressing the storyline, you sometimes need to talk to specific NPCs at specific moments, and some of them just seem like completely random, unimportant people whom you'd never think to give special attention to. And since the game allows you a certain degree of freedom to explore, the process of trying to talk to absolutely everyone available in order to find the way forward can be very time-consuming. Moreover, there's a couple of random parts where you can only progress the plot by sleeping in certain inns, and nothing suggests this. Other times, the mechanics of certain dungeons are just painfully obtuse and beyond what you'd be likely to come up with unless you really strained your imagination against all of your equipment and what seems to be obstructing you. If that wasn't bad enough, there's a handful of dungeon gimmicks which just flat out force you to take damage in order to progress. For some reason, this game is very fond of putting you in toxic, high heat, or ice cold rooms where you've got to move very quickly while trying to figure out how to solve some esoteric puzzle using the clunky four directional controls and burning through all your healing items just trying to keep the party alive. In some cases, this environmental damage can be mitigated by wearing certain accessories, but the game isn't going to warn you about that beforehand. If you're one of those people who's really stalwart about never consulting any help when playing a video game, then you better have a lot of experience and patience with old school adventure games and RPGs, because this one is going to be a hell of a lot longer and the pacing is going to feel considerably stretched if you try to solve every problem yourself. Anyways, since we've now reached the point in the game where the story starts to take more of a backseat to exploration and gameplay, I'd like to focus for a bit on some of the game's more unique mechanics which new players probably won't start to unpack until around this point. Among the most interesting of the game's items is the Rune Bottle, which I wish I'd been cognizant of from a much earlier point. Rune Bottles, when applied to certain items, will upgrade them into a better version of the same, and also identify mystery items making them usable. Something I didn't really grasp until later in the game is that all of the basic item shops will exclusively sell you mediocre rejuvenation items, whereas applying Rune Bottles to them will upgrade them to something better. And since these drop pretty often in random encounters, counters, you're encouraged to use them frequently. You're only allowed to carry 15 of an item at a time, so I'm certain that I spent a lot of the game with a full stock of these, while the ones I acquired from battles just went to waste because I didn't know the extent of what I could have been doing with them. When going into the final battle, I bought a full stock of every curative item, then repeatedly bought full stocks of rune bottles, turned all of my healing items into more powerful ones, and then bought a full stock of the weaker ones again. Had I realized the possibility of this method from the start, I probably would have never once died in the entire game. On the other hand, I'm kind of glad that I didn't get a head start on using the magic lens, because I'd probably still be playing the game had I gotten into it. This item, as you might expect, fills you in on the enemy's stats and weaknesses, but more importantly, it fills out their entry in your bestiary, and you better believe there's a title that you can earn from cataloging every monster in the game, including a large number of one-time encounters. Oh yeah, there's also a title system System, where characters earn titles either via leveling, certain story moments, or finding secrets relevant to them. Only a few of these titles actually do anything, so they mostly function as a sort of old school achievement list, of which I accomplished very little, leading me to only imagine just how many esoteric secrets this game may contain which I haven't yet discovered. Overall, there's just a metric ton of little details in this game which make it easy to imagine coming back to. If all the hidden items and pathways, bonus dungeons, and unlockable titles weren't enough, later on you'll even unlock a collector's book for no reason but to amass a bunch of collectible items that serve no purpose other than giving you an excuse to keep yourself even busier in this game's world. I didn't do much of this, but I do love that it exists. Moreover, it's not just a matter of how much there is to do, but how many types of things you can do. If you really enjoy the characters and their interactions, you can blow an incredible amount of time just hitting the select button over and over after any story event to see all the unique dialogues that can take place, often dependent on the context of where you happen to be standing on the world map. Even getting into fights on the world map can be a blast too, thanks to all the different topographically based battle backgrounds. If you happen to get into a random encounter while crossing a bridge, you'll be fighting on that bridge in the battle, even though this isn't likely to happen more than a couple of times in one playthrough. If you're standing on the beach, there's a unique background for that too, even though you could easily play the entire game without ever stepping out onto the shore. If you want to learn about the world's deeper lore, make sure to check the bookcases everywhere you go, as some of them contain info dumps 
about aspects of the world's mythology which the story won't even touch on. You can also sometimes find contextual bits of entertainment from clicking on things, though frustratingly it's pretty random which objects are interactable, and those are few and far enough between that I didn't feel encouraged to click on absolutely everything in the way that other games might inspire me to. Indeed, while I do think Fantasia's level of detail is praiseworthy, I would hardly say that it amounts to a world as imaginative or memorable as a great Final Fantasy title, nor the constant contextual brilliance of Chrono Trigger. But when it comes to random specificity, it's not as though one piece of flavor can easily be called superior to another. When I realized that the corpses of boars don't disappear from the battlefield because your characters are going to gather their meat afterwards, it brought a smile to my face. Likewise, when I found out that the weapons shop in the elf village has nothing to sell you because they only make bows, and it was obvious I'd be coming here again once I had Tom Bone back in my party. Writing gondolas around Venetia, or discovering unique memory dream cutscenes by accident when sleeping in certain inns at certain times, kept the game feeling fresh and fun and alive in ways that only the best RPGs care to accomplish. Meanwhile, quality of life details like being able to view a list of all the items sold at each of the shops on the world map kept it feeling well thought out. But let me not over glamorize things too much. Tales of Fantasia does take place in a fairly small world and requires a lot more backtracking than what is typical of its genre. The fact that even after using a holy bottle, which prevents random encounters from happening as often, you're still likely to encounter at least one in the brief window before the item's effect wears off can be especially upsetting when you've reached a point at which you're way too powerful for overworld battles to be anything more than a chore. At the very end, you'll finally unlock flying machines, which make world traversal fast and fun, just in time for by far the biggest chunk of optional content preceding the final dungeon, and I don't necessarily think that the game has any severe pacing issues, but my willingness to explore at random definitely dwindled as the game wore on and I got sick of fighting weaker enemies. While the game's most open-ended sections are easily the most fun, at times the plot can run out of drive and leave you feeling like there's nothing really propelling it forward. Several times when you accomplish a goal, the characters don't even know how to progress, so they just kind of go in search of someone to consult about how to proceed, and it makes the adventure feel like it's grinding to a halt, especially in the later part of the game, where most of the major plot events have already transpired, and it feels like the game is just trying to find the chance to wrap up each of its character arcs before it has to head for the climax. By far the worst segment of the entire game comes around the halfway mark when you're sent on a wild goose chase in search of a certain professor, and in order to meet him you must first collect five basilisk scales for him. The basilisk is an uncommon enemy found on the overworld which drops a scale about 80% of the time, which for me amounted to nearly an hour of running around in circles on the world map activating random battles in search of the damn things. It's in moments like this that the game's rather unique approach to fleeing battles starts to feel like a pain in the ass. Rather than fleeing by way of a menu button, Tales of Fantasia requires you to run your character up against the side of the screen for a set amount of time until you escape. The time is reduced if you're high above the enemy's level or there's only a couple of them, but the game is fond of spawning enemies on both sides of you so that you'll have to fight at least half of them before escaping is even an option. Moreover, unless you happen to spawn right on the edge of the screen and have the AI on your mages set to never use spells, there's a good chance that one of them is going to get a spell off before you can finish leaving the screen and you're going to have to sit through their entire spell animation before you can continue your escape, and since these will often kill off a bunch of the small smaller enemies anyways, you'll probably end up feeling like you might as well wrap up the battle at that point regardless. If having to sit through constant spell animation sounds like it could get pretty annoying, that's because it absolutely can. Though it's not so much the wait time which got to me, since the animations themselves are beautiful and consistently satisfying to see the results of, but the fact that they would interrupt me in the middle of my attacks, often placing the enemy in a position where my attack would no longer be effective. Honestly, if you decided to spend more time managing your mage attacks instead of relying on their AI to more slowly choose attacks for themselves, you'd probably feel more effective in battle than if you tried to focus on your own attacks. Still though, as tired as the battles could start to feel in certain moments, when things started to get crazy, they could result in some legitimately pulse-pounding scenarios. I had moments where only one party member was still standing after an enemy attack with barely any health left, so I'd use a life bottle on one of my downed teammates, and in the time that it took for that to take effect, the character who used it would die 
die, meaning that for just a second my entire party was unavailable until the one that I used the life bottle on revived, and then I managed to strategically bring the entire party back to life and up to full health before the battle was over. I know that I said before that this game is so easy on the normal difficulty that I might have been able to beat it without ever getting a game over, but that's only because of the frenetic way that clever healing and item usage can allow you to make a massive comeback. Battle is able to be intense like this because the game has a tendency towards boss encounters with low HP and brutally high attack power, meaning that fights are rarely so much an endurance test as they are a race to see who can lay the smackdown faster. If you come into a battle well prepared with all the right healing items, element resistant armor, overpowered attacks and spells, and even half a sense of what your opponent is going to do, then your odds of stun locking the enemy in an endless loop of attacks are a lot higher, whereas going in underprepared might lock you instead into an endless cycle of healing and revives. The mechanics of death are fascinating in themselves. If your player avatar dies in battle, then you'll take the form of their adorable ghost floating around the battlefield. Teammates can obviously revive you from there, but you can also float yourself over to the side of the screen and perform an escape if you're facing a regular encounter. Having said all of this, if you decide to actually employ an active strategy throughout an encounter, then a lot of the game's biggest challenges will be totally trivialized. I had spent the majority of my game simply attacking normally and using sword arts with games without worrying too much about what my teammates were doing. When I actually got a game over against any of the late game bosses, I would then repeat the encounter not only better prepared, but while diving into the menus to activate my teammates spells one after another as soon as they were finished and utterly dominating the same bosses I had died on. Even the final boss of the game I defeated by trapping in a perpetual stun lock, having placed charms on both spellcasters which cut their cast time in half, and having them constantly spam their most powerful spells while games repeated the same sword art in between casts. On that note, this game also suffers from the optimal strategy problem, wherein certain skills are just so good that it's hard to bring yourself to use another one. In my case, I got so used to spamming sword rain alpha during every fight that I eventually stopped getting creative. Again, I'm sure that a lot of this would change on higher difficulties, and especially on the unlockable challenge mode which tweaks a few of the game's baseline mechanics, but I'm also not necessarily complaining. Rather, handily destroying a boss who had beaten me previously just by employing a modicum of preparation and strategy made me feel cool and smart for having done so, and made me appreciate the mechanics in place for actually requiring me to engage with them on some level, even if I only really had to do it when I was struggling. It should be a testament to the inherent satisfaction of the game's systems that I didn't even get bored just mashing buttons for a majority of my 35 hour playthrough, and that I continued to have fun once I was asked not to do so. Anyways, eventually the story finally continues as you head to the large kingdom of Midgard. Yeah, there's also Moria Mines and such, so the titling conventions beyond references to Norse mythology are also a fantasy du jour pastiche. And during the major turning point scenes, you get to watch some pretty awesome anime cutscenes courtesy of Studio Production IG, who were all over game cutscenes of the PS1 era. Watching the insanely detailed animation on these wyverns, I immediately suspected and confirmed the involvement of animator Ko Yoshinari, whom gamers may know for designing the characters in Valkyrie profile and animating parts of the Ghost in the Shell game for the PS1, and anime fans may know for his consistently phenomenal work including monster animation on stuff like the recent Made in Abyss adaptation. Also involved was his younger brother and Little Witch Academia creator and director Yo Yoshinari, both of them under the direction of Tensai Okamura, who later directed shows such as Metabots, Wolf's Reign, Darker Than Black, and Seven Deadly Sins. I won't go into any more detail because nobody but me gives a shit and I don't have any Anything meaningful to say about all this other than a bunch of cool people that I liked worked on it and it looks incredible. In this midsection of the game, more attempts are made to break up the sameness of town and dungeon excursions which land better than the prior basilisk section. One bit has you participating in a war scenario on the front lines which amounts to running around a large battlefield in search of the enemy commander with a limited amount of time to plow through enemy soldiers and track him down before the enemies make it to Midgar. It's a neat idea, especially with the active day-night cycle that doesn't exist anywhere else in the game, but doesn't amount to much besides constant fighting. It's also around this point that we start to 
learn a bit more about the central villain and his motivations. When the king tells us that all Daos wants to do is to straight up destroy the world, Digibro is so put off by this idea that she flat out doubts it could be true, since it just wouldn't make any sense. At first I thought this was the game taking the piss out of itself again, but as the story progresses we eventually realize that Daos is trying to eradicate civilization so that humans will end their pursuit of magic technology, which is rapidly draining the world's magic resources and killing the world tree. Since our characters come from a future where this has already happened, we know that it doesn't necessarily mean the end of the world, but there's more to it that we'll finally learn after the final battle. Eventually you finally track down and defeat Daos, and then teleport back to the present time for games in Ohimark, but in that time Timeline, someone arrives from 50 years into the future where Daos has re-emerged yet again, having escaped in some kind of time vortex. As such, he needs the heroes deemed legendary for saving the world in his time to come and take Daos out once more, and if this seems confusing, remember I told you not to think about it. The future section of the game really amounts to something of a final roundup of minor plot threads and endgame content, especially once you've acquired the flying machines. It's actually kind of bizarre how many new things are given to you right here at the end, seemingly with the expectation that you won't try to head for the final dungeon right away, but instead to explore and witness the world at your leisure, since a majority of its content is optional. It's around here that you can meet the ninja girl Suzu and pursue her to the hidden ninja village that you'll be lucky to find without the help of a guide. From there you can undergo a mission to recruit Suzu on your team by fighting her Daos mind-controlled parents at the end of a special arena battle in one of the castles. You may have noticed that I didn't give Suzu a goofy nickname, and that's because I never ended up completing the arena battle to do so. Being as I don't have the kind of time in my life to dedicate to 100%ing an old school RPG, I didn't end up doing very much of the bonus content at this point, and actually ended up underleveled for once, which didn't make things much more difficult, but simply necessitated being fully prepared and using strategy for bosses. The arena was simply much too annoying for me to continue trying at the level I happened to be at. It requires you to fight like 10 single enemy battles in a row, which go from trivially easy for the first 7 or 8, to suddenly far more difficult as soon as you fight one that's harder to stun lock and deals a ton of damage per hit. After losing three times and having all patience drained by the overlong unskippable sequence in between fights, I just didn't care enough to bother anymore. I'd already been neglecting the finally regrouped Tom Bone in my party since you can only bring four members into battle at a time, and having to worry about a sixth party member at this late portion of the game just seemed like kind of a hassle. Which is a shame though because Suzu is adorable as hell. I might have been more inclined to explore this future world more thoroughly if not for the letdown of how little it actually changes. The starting village, having obviously been destroyed at the start of the game, is rebuilt and refurbished to be bigger and better than ever, but most of the rest of the world is exactly the same as it was in the past, aside from containing some new NPCs. Once again, this is an area where the minor details do a better job of bringing the world to life, where the broad strokes of the story fail to do so, but by that point I was ready to just crank out the last few dungeons and be over it. Luckily, the final dungeon is plenty satisfying in its own right, as a long, somewhat difficult and memorable level with a proper three-form boss fight at the end. By far the most fun thing about this dungeon though is that the leveling gets totally crazy. Enemies here drop a ton of experience in Gald, and there's a hidden character you can talk to behind a pillar who will also let you trade your Gald for EXP right before the final boss, meaning that you can essentially double your grinding speed just running through the castle once. Using this technique and going back for one more supply run allowed me to utterly dominate the final boss and it felt really great. The game's resolution is surprisingly interesting and nuanced with its light air of melancholy. Given that your party consists of members from different eras, they obviously need to be split up, though as a half-elf, Digibro will actually live long enough to meet her friends again, which I accidentally just thought about and now I'm wondering if she can create a paradox by meeting them as babies? Okay, okay, not gonna think anymore. More interesting still is how each of the characters kind of feels differently about the way things turn out. In the end, it's realized that Daos was trying to keep the world tree alive so that he could obtain the world seed, which he needs to save his own planet, which I assume is the same sister planet involved in the story of Tales of Symphonia. While Games and Tom Bone are satisfied in getting their revenge, Ohimark is left questioning if killing Daos was really doing the right thing, and Ben Saint sees it as an unfortunate necessity given Daos's methods. For the players, we won't have to doubt our actions for long, as it's revealed that Yggdrasil recognized Daos's efforts and releases the world seed to his planet anyways, but for the characters, they will have to live with the moral ambiguity of their actions from here on out. 
Overall, I had a lot more fun with this game than I expected to. In those early hours when the plot felt especially generic and I didn't have enough party members or abilities for the combat to have much depth, I thought I'd be really forcing myself through this game. But once I got sent to the past, recruited the best characters to my party, and was plopped into the open exploration segments, the game really got into its groove. There were times when the narrative pacing started to drag and where I couldn't figure out what the hell to do, only to consult a guide and realize that I probably never would have guessed the solution, but since I don't mind playing with a guide, it wasn't as much of a turnoff for me as it might be for others. When I'd already clocked over 30 hours in, I was pretty much ready for it to be over, but since the game left so much of its additional content optional and gave me so many ways to easily power level in the final dungeon, it didn't feel like I was being told that my playstyle was wrong by the game. Before I wrap it up, I want to make some additional notes about the game's aesthetic for the sake of comparison with future titles. First of all, if you're indeed playing this game on an emulator using the Fantasian Productions translation patch, make sure that you look up the best emulation settings before you start. I'll put a link to a YouTube video that I used to get them on EPSX in the description. Without setting these up, certain cutscenes will play too fast and skip their sound files, and overlay effects will be glitched out, so it's very important. While the 16-bit style of pixel art in this game overall looks very nice on the PC, PS1, the fact that it's building directly over the SNES game's layout means that a lot of the world design is very rigid and blocky in that RPG Maker kind of way. It's nice that they at least tried to create unique architectural styles in different towns, and little touches like the reflections in water and mirrors are weirdly impressive feeling in the context of a game which looks like this, but obviously I'll be hoping for more from future games in the series. My favorite artistic flourish is that all of your weapons and shields have unique sprites which actually show up on your characters in battle, which remains consistent throughout the franchise and does an enormous amount to keep the battles looking fresh even if they all basically do the same thing. A lot of the enemy sprites are cool looking or adorable as well, with the harpies being my personal favorite, but you'll no doubt encounter countless color swaps of the same enemies as you would probably expect. As far as audio flourishes go, aside from the extensive voicing, the game puts a lot of thought into which songs are used at which moments. Sometimes the overworld or town themes will be supplanted by something contextually appropriate for what's happening in the story, and certain cutscenes will take away the ability to mash through text boxes so that they can time the dialogue out to match the length of the BGM. I know that almost everyone who plays JRPGs is generally a bigger fan of playing games with the sound on at all times than I am, so this will probably mean more to you than it did to me. I should also note that while I personally really enjoyed the Fantasian Productions translation, it is meant to be read as a localization, and certain moments will probably come off a little extra to people who prefer sticking as close to the feeling of reading the Japanese script as possible. Personally, I didn't have any trouble reverse engineering in my head what I thought the Japanese dialogue probably looked like, and I appreciated that the game included options to either see literal or localized versions of the attack names so that they could be the same as what I grew up with in Symphonia, but your mileage may vary. There is another translation patch from Absolute Zero, who were probably the biggest contributors to Tales of Translations overall, which I've heard is a lot more literal, so if you really don't want to hear the characters use words like dude even once, then you might want that version. If you find yourself particularly enamored with this game and just can't get enough, there's a decent handful of tie-in media properties which may continue to entertain you. In 1999 and 2000, there were like eight novel tie-ins penned, some of which fill in parts of the story that had been lost from the original Tale Fantasia concept, but none have been translated into English. From 2004 to 2006, a four-episode OVA was released which adapts a practically random spattering of major scenes from the game. Seriously, the first episode goes from summarizing the first four hours of the game in less than five minutes, all the way straight into the war scene that happens more than halfway in. If you haven't played the game already, the anime basically makes no sense at all, but at least it's drop dead gorgeous, so if you do love the game and just want to see it more extensively brought to life, then this is worth checking out. There was also a single volume manga released in 2008, but I uh, couldn't make it past the artwork. More importantly than any of that, Tales of Fantasia also had a full-blown sequel on the Game Boy Color called Tales of Fantasia Narikiri Dungeon. This game also received a PSP remake, which appears to be so different from the original that it might as well be a different game entirely, but sadly it's yet to receive a full translation patch. There's a patch for the menus only, as well as a full translation of the story script which can be read online, but no combination of these yet into a full-on playable English game. In the event that such a thing should occur, I may consider making a separate video about this pair of games somewhere along the line in the Tales of Tales of series, but since the little I've gleaned about this game would suggest 
suggests that its connections to Fantasia are largely tangential, I didn't feel a pressing urge to play it for the sake of this particular video. And that accounts for the extent of my research on and feeling towards the first game in the Tales series. In the end, I came away excited to chronicle the evolution of these games going forward, and perhaps to identify my personal favorite after experiencing them all. The next game in the series is the legendary Tales of Destiny, which properly debuted the series on the PlayStation for real, so if you're excited to learn about it, then be sure to subscribe to the channel. For more JRPG action, you should also tune in to our live stream show, which is currently playing through Chrono Cross bit by bit on Thursday nights at 6pm Eastern, along with other games on Tuesday at the same time, and random drunken party streams on Fridays at midnight. Check out our t-shirts as well if you want to be the games you want to see, and let us know what games you think we should cover on this channel in the comments. I am Games, signing out.